You're listening to the Be Better Off Show by Kelly Partners. Well, welcome to the Be Better Off Show, where we get great Australians who can help us be healthier, wealthier, and wiser. And this morning, we're very, very lucky to have Nikki Sparshot, the CEO of Unilever ANZ and Global CEO T2, to join us and tell us about this amazing brand and her personal career journey. Good morning, Nikki. Good morning, Brett. Thank you for having me. Really, really great to have you with us because everybody loves tea and everyone loves the T2 brand. I remember when we first saw it, we thought it was so innovative and different. But I'll come to that. I always love to ask people, you know, to start at the beginning because the beginning is a good place to start. Where did you grow up and what, what were your parents and brothers and sisters into and you went off to university and how did you end up in, in the sort of place that you are now from a career perspective? Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't grow up thinking I want to be a CEO of a, a big company, actually. So it was a series of a uh, bit of serendipity, bit of choices and a bit of luck along the way that kind of led me here. But um, I grew up in Sydney. So I'm a Sydney girl, my mum and dad and uh, my brother and my sister, very much a key part of my life. I grew up in a very multicultural family, actually. So we've got sort of Italian background, French, Egyptian I ended up marrying a Scotsman, so my children are very confused <laughs> around what they are, but that sort of multicultural spirit very much uh, alive and kicking for me. And, look, I, I grew up always with this interest in business, so whether it was the, you know, cake stall that I set up outside my parents' home or the equivalent of the lemonade stand, there was always something about trade, producing something beautiful that someone else might want to buy that always really, really appealed to me and kind of led me on to the choices that I made from a a kind of uni perspective. I went and did a business degree. I then went on to do a master's in international trade because that really appealed, this idea of embracing different cultures, countries, political environments, economic environments, and seeing if you can take different brands that thrive under different conditions just really kind of floated my boat, let's say. That plus a little bit of the travel, that that, that kind of... uh, experience would open up and uh, and that took me through a couple of you know job choices uh, working across a number of multinational companies over the last sort of 25 years that eventually brought me to this Unilever CEO role so I think that sort of that entrepreneurial business thread has been live and kicking uh, but ultimately the role that I'm in right now in the T2 role I love probably the most and that's because I feel like I'm part of an organisation where being a force for good in the world of kind of corporate enterprise is very much part of our DNA. Yeah, very cool. So for for our listeners, Nikki um, was a brand manager at Procter & Gamble, then senior marketing manager at Coca-Cola, then marketing director of Unilever Australasia, food, ice cream and beverages, all the good stuff, and then CEO of T2. Through all of that journey, obviously Procter & Gamble, Unilever have great... um, you know, long-term history of training um, brand marketers. is it, Was that an attraction? Was it working around Australia or around the world? What, what, what was it that sort of took you to marketing? Just that interest in trade or? You, you know, I tell you what, the, what I love the most is that if we strip everything away, the real boss our real bosses are the people that buy our product, right? It's the consumer. I hate the word consumer, but it is the, you know, it's the consumer. It's the person that that enjoys our, our products every day. And you know, a company like Unilever, we have, you know, two and a half billion people every day that have a Unilever product. And so what took me to marketing was just how do you get under the skin of the people that you serve? Because I'm a big believer that when you really understand that, I do believe that our ultimate boss is the people that buy our product. You know, we use the word consumer. I don't particularly like that word, but it is those people that actively choose to use your product in our instance sort of almost every single day. And so I've got this really strong belief that at the heart of any good business is a really strong appreciation of the people that you serve. And actually the marketing function in an organisation is really the steward of that in so many ways. And so I wanted to get under the skin of those people to understand not just their demographics, but their the psychology of how they make choices, what gets them up in the morning, what matters to them on a daily basis, and therefore how can we create brands 
that either create utility or entertainment or just joy. And so that's what took me to the world of marketing. And that's actually, I think it's held me in quite good stead over my career because it doesn't really matter what type of industry you're in or what kind of business you're part of, you still need to understand the people that are interested. Yeah, that's a great point. So you mentioned earlier that two and a half billion people a day are using a Unilever product, which I think is extraordinary. And I think a company's story is extraordinary in itself. But you're one of the few CEOs of a major organisation in, in Australia that has a marketing background. So often um, CEOs come from finance and other, you know, what I consider compliance areas. But as Jeff Bezos says, you know, your customer is your ultimate boss. And I do think that, you know, great founder leaders of businesses are almost always out of the sales and marketing bent slash function because they have this close appreciation and real heart for the client, so, which I think is is very, very interesting. What do you think of a marketing-based, you know, a, a person as a CEO with a marketing background brings to that role that, that makes a difference to your team? I think it does bring that, you know, that, that consumer centricity to the decisions that we make, to how we prioritise choices in the PL to how we allocate resources in order to extract value uh, for today, but also for tomorrow. So I think I'm a really big believer that the financial outcomes are exactly that. They're outcomes, yeah, outcome. the choices that you make. I mean, I've never worked in a business where I have managed to motivate anybody or been motivated by anybody that stands up and says, hey, everyone, we're going to deliver X much more profit versus last year. I mean, that great. Absolutely, as a business, we have a financial obligation to create profitable growth because when we do that, we can invest in things that have a regenerative impact on the environment. We can invest in things that have a a positive impact on communities. And I do believe that business should be a contributor to a fairer and more socially inclusive world, but you need profitable growth to do that. But I think they're outcomes, you know, those yeah, financial yeah, things are outcomes. No question. So you come to you come from that position. I, 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 it very much resonates with me that our, our business is a service business. I think all businesses are a service business. Um, and that they have to serve it, you know, a legitimate need of a person. And that means we need to understand the people, um, which I think marketing gives you a great appreciation of because it's so, you know, if it's done well, it's people centered. Yeah. When you come to T2 milk, you know, that, oh, sorry, T2 tea, um, that journey, how well did you know the founders before Unilever bought the business? How has that transition worked? What is it that you think? has made that a great brand. So a little bit of a story of serendipity, let's say. When I had my first child, Kira, she's now 16, I remember writing my CV, updating my CV, which was paper-bound at that point in time, um, in a T2 store uh, as I applied for a job at Unilever. Now, T2 was a brand that was part of my life, was part of my repertoire before any professional engagement that I had with it. I really loved the tea. I loved the tea wares. I loved the experience of being in their stores. And and at that point in time, they had a little cafe concept, which I I used to love taking Kira there and she could have her little kind of strawberry tea while I had mine. Um, So it was was something that I just really appreciated from a brand point of view. Then when we started to become more interested in it from a business lens, I had the good fortune of spending quite a bit of time with the founder, so Marianne Shearer, and she's formidable, right? She had a vision for how to disrupt the tea category and democratise access to not just, you know, black tea with milk and sugar, which was how Australians were consuming it, but to offer up a really eclectic world of tea from around the world um, and break all of the rules around what you should mix with it. And so I think she had a vision maybe before its time um, because now obviously tea has has really taken off. I think founders like Marianne have um, not only incredible vision, imagination, creativity, they, they focus on the opportunity cost of not doing something as opposed to the risk of doing it quite often. And the other thing that they just have in spades is grit, this sheer bloody-minded determination to see through their vision and to, you know, create a culture that enables that to happen. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know her. And I think at that point in time, the business was 
at a point where without the support of some expertise that Unilever could bring, she wasn't able to realise part of what was her own personal legacy, which was to scale it and create a T2 generation on every continent. And so we were able to bring the capability that sat in Unilever with the magic that also sat in T2 to then be able to um, scale that business um, across the globe. So that's been a, a fantastic journey for me to be on professionally, but also personally. Yeah, I saw, it was funny when I saw the brand, I loved I, I loved what they were doing because I love great brands and I, I share your enthusiasm for their sort of in-store experience. And interestingly, sort of having an understanding of Unilever, when I saw that deal happen, I thought, okay, that actually makes sense. You see a lot of deals happen and you can't see the logic. Yeah. Um, but the logic there, you know, to me seemed to be really obvious. But um, I guess in all these um, partnerships is, you know, the magic is in the execution. How did you then partner to write the business plan together? How do you keep the, I guess, often the vision of a founder is different to, to the short-term metrics of corporations. How did you get that piece to work, especially early on? So let's start by saying that when we when we acquired T2, unlike some acquisitions, we, we didn't do it for synergy. We did it for growth. We really passionately felt that this was a beautiful brand that had potential to go global, had potential to diversify its channel footprint beyond sort of physical retail stores into an e-commerce landscape that it hadn't yet fully embraced. Um, and and we also felt that there was, you know, new product potential and innovation potential that hadn't yet been fully leveraged. So we never placed very strict short-term objectives on that. We were always investing ahead of the curve in order to be able to create something that was going to yield value beyond one year, right? It's quite easy to deliver a one-year result. It's how do you build, build consistency and sustainability in that? And, of course, there's sometimes tensions that come with corporations and smaller sort of founder-like startup setups. But I think where, where it really worked was when we respected each other's expertise. So, you know, where we carved out how to unlock the respective superpowers that sit in the organisation. Like I can't, I'm a big believer of sort of every organisation is a bit like Marvel Avengers, right? <laughs> There's like superpowers that sit in different parts of the business. How do you bring them together to actually do something really formidable? And, and that was great. And actually that first new market entry into the UK brought some real success and momentum. We got many things right. We also didn't. Um, you know, we failed in some areas and that, that was good learning to then help us as we went into the US or as we went into Singapore. Uh, but I think, look, at the heart of, of, of your question, it was around sharing a common vision, a passion for unlocking the strengths that sat in both organisations. And then um, maybe the last one is a cultural one and it's quite important cultural one. It was how to respect the past and take the very rich DNA that existed in T2 and not lose it, but at the same time recognise that sort of what got us here wouldn't get us there, and therefore how do you embrace a new future as well and bring the new and the old or the traditional and the pioneering together in a way that you could uh, do something that had not been done before. Yeah, and and so at that time, like uh, the, the global CEO of, Unilever had his own dramas of trying to trying to get his shareholders to think more than 10 minutes in advance. You know, how do you make these small deals work in a massive organization that's that's also got those challenges running? Are you able to it was it on the Australian PL or how did you how did you actually manage that? When we make acquisitions like this, we do it for the strength of the brand but also for the capability that it gives us. So acquiring a business like T2 and many of the other acquisitions that Unilever has made over the years has also been about capability. You know, we, we are an FMCG company predominantly and therefore our strengths have largely sat in that, let's say, more traditional channel space, you know, supermarkets, grocery, et cetera. And this was a business that was in bricks and mortar retail, for which we had some experience for sure, but wasn't our bread and butter and had the potential to really invest in the direct-to-consumer channel and really understand 
what it was like to, you know, just to some extent cut out the middleman and have a direct relationship with, with the people that we serve, with our community of advocates. And that's very attractive to investors as well. You know, this is a company that is trying to reimagine um, a future for itself that's different to the legacy of the past. So we had a lot of support from investors, from our board, and from, you know, the executive leadership team of Unilever as well. So does T2 give you a pathway to look at some of the other amazing brands that you have and imagine a direct-to-consumer model that I can see, I think KitKat are doing a little bit of. Um, I've seen a Kit, I'm sure I've seen a KitKat store or a Nestle store, um, but you think of things like Cornetto and other amazing brands that you have. Is there a future in, in online and direct-to-consumer that there are lessons from T2 for you in? Yeah, undeniably. So across, uh, I mean, and across our brand portfolios, um, mm. just how, how do you have different relationships with consumers? And again, at the heart of it, you know, this, none of this is rocket science, right? It's just, we just want to be where people are. Yeah, and yeah. if people are <laughs> online, then, you know, because it's actually convenient to be able to shop 24-7 or when the kids are in bed or, yep. you know, when you've got five minutes, then then we we want to be part of that um, that journey as well. So I think probably every company and every brand at their peril, <laughs> to, you know, needs to be looking at where people are. Yeah. So you, you, you come through, you've got the T2 piece, but you've also got the Unilever piece. What is it that excites you about your career? And I guess... To your 20-year-old self, I love to ask people, you know, to your 18-year-old self or 20-year-old self, you know, what are the things that you think you've learned the most that have helped you the most that you wish you knew when you were 20? The first one is, you know, don't aimlessly seek to climb a corporate ladder. You know, try to build a career that has a set of really rich, different experiences. So when I think about career now or if I'm giving advice to others, including my kids, it's it's a bit more like a rock climbing wall. You know, sometimes you're going to make steps up. Sometimes you're going to go to the side. Sometimes you might even go back a little bit because you're, you're learning something that is that is not native to you, but you want to go get that experience because it's where the future's heading. This is all, these are good choices. So think about your career as a rock climbing wall and try to fill your toolkit with many different tools and then, then you can sharpen where you want to put your energies and efforts based on your own kind of superpowers, I would say. It's a good, yeah, it's a good analogy. It's a very good analogy. Because yeah. the great rock climbers are very strong, they're very flexible of, of body but also of mind and sometimes the wall, you know, the way it looks from where you are is an actual, you know, up's not up and down's not down. That's um, right. So that spatial awareness is, is very interesting. Yeah, that would be the first thing. And, and related to that, the second thing I would say is ha- just have courage. You know, we, we fear what we don't know and yet stepping into the unknown quite often can be the most exhilarating choice that you can make. So I've always taken a path less travelled um, more often than not and I've usually taken a deep breath when I've done it and gone, oh, is that going to be the right thing? And people have said to me, gosh, why did you make that choice? And But uh, I've done it for, you know, for the, for the opportunity and the experience that it brings. So I would say courage is a really, really, I think it's actually a big a differentiator for people um, in, in corporate environments and beyond sort of these days. And the last thing I would say is um, have some fun along the way. You know, we spend a lot of time at work, more time than with our families and friends. And you got to fill your bucket because you can't give energy to others if you don't you have, don't have energy, energy for yourself. Yeah. And so I do, I, you know, I don't know if fun comes up often enough as a critical imperative of an organisation or a team that you're part of, but, hell, there are going to be plenty of problems that come our way. Um, It's good to be able to know that you're part of a team where you can also have a bit of joy. Uh, I don't think that having joy and having fun is the domain of your social life alone. I think it is important to have that dimension in your work. I think it's so true, no question. I think you also bring energy to to a situation. And you yes. can so often choose the energy that you bring. So, as a you know, my superpower is finding amazing people and bringing them together. And when I see you know the one pager that I was sent on you, the the career observation I note is that you've been in most of your roles for five years. And you know, one of the things I've seen so often today is people are they think they can get done in five minutes what actually takes five years, um, and that in a role getting the depth you sort of just don't know what you don't know and doing things 
more than once does tend to build a bit of mastery. So I, th- I thought that was, I, I looked at your, your one page and I was the first thing I noticed. I often get, you know, one page is on people's careers put in front of me and I'm like, okay, they've done, you know, one year everywhere. And, right. and it's almost like they've got nowhere because they, they haven't actually done anything, which is really, which is really interesting. If, so that 20 year old self, you're saying, you know, be courageous understand that your career is a bit more like rock climbing, which I think I've never heard before. And I think it's a very, very good distinction um, and bring some energy and joy to, to, to what you're doing because you spend so much time at work in terms of finding the people that, that have given you um, great opportunities. How did you find them and, and have your, your professional networks been important? Um, what role do you think that's played? I think a really important one. So I've had the very good fortune of working with some of the best leaders I could have had, right? They're exceptionally good at what they do, so they have incredibly good capability and in, and very good IQ um, that they leverage to great effect um, as well as EQ in equal measure. I've equally worked with some people that I have learnt a lot from, but not because they've been awesome, but because they've been less than awesome. But I look back. Just having and that think, conversation this morning. Right. You learn and, more from them. <laughs> and you actually do, right? So as painful as the situation is at that point in time, yeah. it's funny how much they actually help you to decide how you're going to show up and not show up. And so I'm grateful for both of those experiences. But what I've also learned is, you know, generosity is a real thing. Like I, people have been very generous with me, with their time, with their advice, um, with the introductions, and, and I do the same for others. Like I do karma's a thing in my mind. Yeah. And so I, I like, you know, I, I, I do the same as well because I do think we have to lift everybody. You know, you can either have resource constrained mindset or you can have an abundance mindset and and when I think about abundance I think well the only way you're going to get abundance is by actually recognizing the huge group of people and quite often problem shared problem halved sometimes you catch up with people and you think gosh the they've already cracked it and I could just you know steal shamelessly equally I may have cracked something and I can give generously so I think that network, it's, and for me, there's a difference between networking. Yeah, which yeah. Kind of has this negative bit kind of. I hate the blocks. term, just personal relationships, yeah. actually. It's that. Showing up and investing in other people, knowing that if you give over time, it tends to come back and it doesn't Correct. come back from, doesn't come back from where you put it out. It, I, I'm a huge believer in karma and momentum. I just yeah. believe in it. So you think that generosity of spirit that other people have shown to you and that you, you've been able to pass on to others has, has been something that's very much animated your career. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do. I really, really do. And I, I think because it's easy to get trapped in your own echo chamber, isn't it? And, and maybe even more so over the last two years when we've been, you know, remote and at home. And, and so just those engagements with others that can provide a different perspective, I think is really important. Um, and, I, you know, there's a lot that's, that's sort of being said around diversity of perspective, but I think it is critically important. It's easy to say it, but actually when you truly harness it, that's when you actually get um, the benefit of expertise and, and beginner's mindset. Like I think the 20 sort of five, six years experience that I bring is my my biggest strength and my blind spot <laughs> that I can bring to the table. And so I, I, I go out of my way to check myself, to just sort of make sure that the choices I'm making or, or where I'm seeking my advice is diverse enough such that I'm not, I'm not missing something because otherwise I might make a decision based on experience that's just, it's just not relevant today, especially with the pace of change yeah. that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of diversity and importantly rather than but um i think people don't do enough geographic diversity so they're stuck in one suburb particularly in sydney they don't do enough age diversity in particular we're very ageist you can't be sexist but you can be ageist um, and i think we're incredibly ageist and we miss a lot because of it 
you know, our boards of directors come from three suburbs. Our senior executive teams come from five schools. That's still hugely prevalent. Whereas, you know, the virtually the corporate class that speaks the most about diversity practices at the least. Like I'd love to see state parliament have to sit, you know, for a month each year from Orange and a month each year from Campbelltown and a month each year from Wollongong so that they could, and they'd have to drive there every day or get there on the public transport that they provide. I think that's exactly right. There's something about lived experience here. It's, and that's why I, I you know, I, I understand quotas but because the pendulum is so far from where it needs to be that sometimes this helps to just shift the needle. But you can have a very different looking set of people sitting around a boardroom table or an executive table, which makes you feel good that you may have captured diversity but actually, if they're all thinking the same way and they're confirmation all, they're, they're bias is same. live and kicking, totally. then actually you've not really done anything. So, you know, I, I actually think it's about the thought that people bring, the perspective that they bring, and, and that, you know, you've got to be able to then cope with the inconvenient truth that comes with that <laughs> because our job is not to sit around the table and high-five each other because we're harmonious in our thinking, but actually high five ourselves because we might have different points of view but if we can harness that dynamic tension well then more often than not we're going to get to outcomes that we wouldn't have been able to get to on our own and I agree with you there's so much work to be done even in a country like Australia that's supposed to be as progressive as it is in this in this space yeah I think and I think the outcome of that like I I love the idea of putting Paul Hogan in a in a um corporate boardroom um, because I'm certain that his 70s shtick would be quite out of place. Um, but I also, like, I, I love to see boardrooms today trying to deal with paying the Chinese female tennis player who, you know, notwithstanding me to 2021, nobody seems that interested in the fact that she's disappeared um, other than the Women's Tennis Association have now said that they'll pull all of their tournaments next year if the Chinese government don't don't give a satisfactory explanation. Now, the NBA, you know, in the US couldn't deal with it. Um, most Australian corporations pretend they can't see it. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of diversity talk, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet. And, to, and the training, you know, most, most of our senior people are coming through the same training. That training tends to narrow thinking rather than broaden it. And I think you see, you know, when you go and you look at the businesses that break through, say a T2, for example, that's close close to home for you, the founder of that business would have struggled to, to, to probably be hired into most corporations um, because I'm sure they'd be quite radically different to, to what typically gets through the funnel. Um, so I think that opportunity of, you know, through acquisition, bringing diverse mindsets, but also, you know, getting people out of their normal environment um, and making them work from places with people that they normally wouldn't interact with, I think is really interesting. You know, I really like boss, that idea. You know, yeah, boss for a day, sort of make, make, make the senior execs go and work from the warehouse with their laptops or, or you know, get people to – this idea of bumping into people but really make people bump into people that are part of their organisation but not so, sort of part of their little group I think is really, really interesting. I went and spent – I did this a few times but, out, you know, go spend some time fulfilling orders out in the DC um, with the team there. You've got a certain sort of – belief of how things are going to run and how it works and and then when you go and do it it's so much harder and complex and less efficient than what you anticipate and that was brilliant for me because it helped me to understand the process it helped me to understand whether our tech was fit for purpose helped me to understand actually when someone's coming in and doing a shift what what it actually looks like to do a a four to eight hour shift fulfilling e-commerce orders, whether it's, you know, taking product off the shelves or whether it's labelling or whether it's wrapping for Christmas. And I I sort of did all of those functions. And then you can have a conversation as a a board of to say, well, actually, have we got the right enablers in place to allow us to scale up in this area? Probably not. And I I do think just taking that time is really, really valuable because I think what we think is happening and what the reality is for frontline workers is quite often different and yet it is these frontline workers, your field team, your DC teams, your logistics teams, your factory 
you know, team members, that these are the guys that are keeping the business running day in, day out, and girls day in, day out, that, that we have to take the time to, to listen to, genuinely listen to more. I'm, I'm quite kind of passionate advocate of this idea of a shadow board that's made up of, you know, a group of people. Randoms. That, I call yeah. them randoms. But yeah, pretty much, because actually, and we found it during COVID, one of you know, there were many, many challenges that were over the last, you know, two years of COVID and no doubt will continue to feel in 2022, but I'm a glass half full kind of girl, so I can't help but also look at some of the silver linings. And, and one of them was just, you know, when we're in the middle of crisis and we have to make decisions quickly, the people that are best equipped to surface the issues, come up with creative solutions, they're, they're, they are your, your frontline workers. And, um, and we relied on them more than ever before to sort of make make decisions fast on some of the stuff that needed to be done. And, and, and I, you know, one of my own lessons as a leader was how to make sure that you unlock potential that's, you know, how do you leverage distributed leadership much more overtly because, you know, that that's where the real magic can happen. Yeah, I think getting, like, I to an earlier comment, like problem clients, problem employees, are where and problems generally are where the great learnings are. Finding the most aggro, misfitted, um, annoying, whatever somebody calls them, team member. Um, we've got so much learning out of those people because they don't think like everyone else and often they're prepared to say it. So instead of them being sort of pushed down, trying to get in their face and engage with them and understand it's really interesting. I also consider that in our game, I had the benefit of working from undergrad through to partner in a number of different firms. And so I really hands-on understand those, all of those jobs. And I think that, you know, if an exec comes into a business, um, often now laterally, if they don't get to spend the time in those roles, I remember talking to um, Russo who did the turnaround of Target and he said he just spent the first 90 days going, working in roles, talking to the people and, and asking them, if you were running the company, what would you change? And he took a junior accounts member and they made the list and then they valued the financial impact of every decision. And then they stack ranked them, went back to those teams and asked them to implement them. And they, they turned a business that was losing a lot of money into a business that was making some money. The, the, the turnaround was billions. But it, it's quite an interesting theme and I'm passionate about the idea of, of, of letting people fight out an answer with you, you know, rather than sort of bottom up leadership trying to get into those frontline roles and find out what the hell's actually going on because I believe people are good like I'm a half full guy like I believe people are good that they want to do good they want to come to work and feel valued and do good things they don't come to work to steal so the question is how do you ask them you know how do you get them to share with you yeah better Um, so true and I think it's how do you um how do you occupy it's like duality is the thing, right? <laughs> How do you operate 30,000 feet in the air so that you can actually create a vision and a plan that's that's forward thinking as well because you need yeah. to be able to lay the foundations to enable that to be realised but simultaneously get deep in the weeds at times and roll up your sleeves and muck in and, and you can't sort of just choose to operate in one domain, actually. I think yeah. you, I think if I was 30, you know, I think if I was deep in the weeds every day out in the field with the team, the guys would, be, you know, and the girls would be like, wow, <laughs> just back off and give us our space. And yet, um, and at the same time, so I need to be able to go between both. And I think any any good leader, irrespective of what role they hold in an organisation, I That's think safe. needs to be able to do yeah. to do that as well. And it's, it's also, I think, helping um sort of more junior people as they come through the the ranks of the organization to also get 30,000 feet in the air help them to understand that sometimes the choices today might not make sense if you're only looking at a 30 day horizon or if you're looking at a even a 6 month horizon but actually that they are going to enable us to be sustainable uh, into the future in a really meaningful way and and I think you know, helping people to do the and and is is really important. Yeah, particularly with brand. You know, if you're trying to build brand, it's it's decades, not minutes. Um, and to have that, you know, to you see a lot of brands sort of, I think, shed a lot of equity through short termism, um, underinvest in the long term position, and trying to get everyone on board to understand that right through the organisation operations, and 
and everything else you're doing, I think, is so important. I love to always finish with a weird question, Nikki, and I've so enjoyed our time and it's gone quickly. I hope for our listeners that we'll have too. The motto, quote, or thought that best summarises your approach to life. When you're skating on thin ice, you may as well tap dance. That's yeah. uh, advice that was given to me very early on in my career and actually it's how I, it is how I live my life, professionally and personally. Fantastic. For, for everyone who, who tunes into this episode, I've really enjoyed meeting Nikki today and hearing her story. I think we can all learn so much about people's individual journeys and I, I want to thank you for the generosity you've shown um, to, to me and our people today, Nikki. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Be Better Up show. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Have a great day.